board. Awesome. Okay, so I'm not going to hang around because I want to make ensure that there's maximum time for the actual presentation and minimum kind of introduction from me. But just to say welcome, everyone. Um, it's really great to have you join us. Um, and just to check you're in the right place, this is the Childhood and Society Special Interest Group um, at Middlesex University. And I'm Jane Osgood and I convene the special interest group and um, facilitate this seminar series. So just to briefly give you an, um, some insight into um, what the seminar seri in series intends to do, it's intended as a, a, a very informal and friendly space, that's the intention, where um, educational researchers at Middlesex and their colleagues um, <coughs> elsewhere have opportunities to share their current research um, and really it's we take the concept of childhood and society in its very broadest sense so we have a very wide range of presentations um, and that's reflective of the diversity of childhood research that we have um, within the education department at Middlesex. We also invite people to present their work at various stages of um, of formulation so it may be a research idea or it may be a research project that's come to it to an end it could be a massively funded externally funded research project or it could be a phd study it's it's a house it's a home for all of those pieces of research and the audience for the seminar series is um principally an internal audience um within the education department at Middlesex, but we also record the sessions and we make it publicly available via our website. So it's it's both in internal and outward facing. Um, and um, yeah, it's really, as I say, it's an opportunity to showcase the research undertaken by Middlesex educational researchers. And um, we cover issues um, around pedagogy and practice, policy, research innovation, um, theories and theorists, um, philosophers and specific topics, specific issues and often a combination of all those things. Um, but really what unites us, we are very diverse, we cover a very broad church, but we're united by a commitment to offer a critical engagement and to pursue um, social justice in in its many forms. So I'm going to allow um, the presenters, Abele and Emanuela, to introduce themselves and their paper. But I'm absolutely delighted that we have um, Abele again. Um, his presentation in the last year's uh, series was very well received um, and generated a huge amount of debate and discussion afterwards and in the Q&A. So there will be time for question and answer towards the end. Um, but that's where I'm going to stop with the introduction and hand over to Abele. Thank you. Many thanks, Jane. So it's great to, yeah, to be here again and to give a talk together with my, our colleague from the University of Turin, from the Department of Education, the University of Turin, uh, Emanuela Guarcello. Uh, the, title of our uh, talk is uh, Critical Thinking and Judgment, combining Hannah Arendt and Danilo Docci's approaches to character education in a project developed for a primary school in Turin, Italy. Uh, so uh, Emanuela has published extensively on, uh, on the topic and uh, particular focus on Hannah Arendt. Uh, I also, yeah, as you know from, you know, from my uh, previous talk, work on uh, Danilo Dolci. So we combine here our effort, let's say, for this talk and this project, which uh, is taking place in a school um, in um, Turin, near Turin. Uh, so the seminar uh, reflects on quality education for the promotion of uh, active and responsible citizenship in uh, primary school, as I said, focusing on the meaning and the sense of two central skills that education for sustainable development promotes in children. So the ability to think and judge critically. So these skills will be discussed, as I said, in the context of a proposed methodological implementation 
in a primary school in Turin. And they will be drawing on the theoretical work of Hannah Arendt and uh, Danilo Dol. So I hand over now to uh, Emanuela. I'm very pleased to be invited to your talk, uh, and so I would like to thank, uh, in particular, Abele Longo and uh, Jane Oswood for this invitation. So, uh, starting with the first part of our presentation on uh, thinking and uh, judgment capacity, in my first part, we will uh, clarify some basic aspects of the meaning of these two faculties, relying on the thought of Hannah Arendt, a scholar well known for her commitment in the philosophical political field during the last century. We will try to understand some of our theoretical contributions to the educational field and to the primary school work, overcoming the most known essay crisis in education. Indeed, we will explore the latest Arendtian works that are less known in the educational and the scholastic field, and that refer in particular to the thinking and the judgment and judging in human capacity meant as Arendt as central capacity for the definition of the character of the whole in the Arendt world personality, setting that crossing point between soul and self-presentation to the world. It is particularly in the last and unfinished work, The Life of the Mind, published in 1970, that aren't works on a clarification of what she calls faculty of thinking. The faculty of thinking deals with a very precise work, the understanding of the meaning of our existence in the world. Precisely for this reason, thinking is the capacity through which we ask those questions that are unanswerable because they concern topics that do not have a definitive answer, such as freedom, death, beauty, or faith. Why do we human beings ask questions to which we cannot in fact give a definitive answer? Because our own humanity makes us feel an indispensable passion to question ourselves on the meaning of our existence in the world, even without having a direct and immediate utility. Of course, this capacity to think, to reason, does not exhaust all the activity of our mind. In fact, it interacts with the capacity to know, observe the world as it is given to the senses, for all of we can grasp with a good margin of certainty because it is evident. What are the meanings of, of these two capacities? Why are both indispensable to our being in the world in an active way as protagonists of our existence? Because if the intellect makes us know the world for what it already is, it is only our reason that makes us understand the world for how it should be transformed to become that environment of quality, also in the sense of sustainability, within which to lead a life on a human scale. The dialogue between intelligence and thought, between intelligence and reason, is the only one that allows us to ask ourselves if what is concretely feasible also has such a meaningful human existence to make it right. So whether it should be done or avoided, or if it is already done, transformed. And it is precisely in this sense that thinking is critical thinking. It is an invisible wind that questioning and examining everything that happens literally dissolves the accepted social rules those cliches that are commonly accepted and critically, although incorrect and ethically unacceptable. In the end, the consequences, wrote Arendt, is that thinking inevitably has a destructive effect, undermining effect on all established criteria, values, measurements of good and evil, in short, on those customs and rules of conduct that we treat of immorals and ethics. 
These suggestions can have deep implications for the primary education, especially if we think to the cognitive and functionalistic centering in the teaching approaches of schools nowadays. Our teaching is now centered especially or totally on the promotion of the faculty of knowing what is useful should be only one part of our teaching in each disciplinary field. We should restart, as also said by Agnes Seller, to teach each cultural field not only for its immediate usefulness, but presenting it as a space to cultivate a human capacity give sense, mathematical sense, musical sense, physical sense, literary sense to our life, to teach what is useless but gives a fully human sense to our life. But the exercise of the faculty of thinking is not sufficient to promote a fully quality education in the primary schools aimed at promoting a concrete, active and responsible citizenship. It is particularly in the work Lectures on Kant's Political Philosophy, a collection of lectures given in the 1970s, that Arendt works on a clarification of what she calls Faculty of Judging. The Faculty of Judging, understood as the highest human faculty, deals with a second precise work, consisting of making manifest the thinking outcomes and of translating them into decision and action, an action that allows us not only to understand, but to make the world as it, as it should be, that is to act concretely for its transformation. And it is in this sense that judgment is a critical judgment. In fact, it is a judgment that we can understand with the rental world as a capacity to discern the different aspects of reality, to define the criteria of choice, to decide and act, problematizing the knowledge of common sense, sounding out prejudices and stereotypes, working on choices and actions that are also counterintuitive and that are able to hold together the contradictory aspects of the reality. Relying on Kantian thought, and in particular on the work critique of the faculty of judgment, Arendt proposes that the formation of the capacity to judge be conducted through the moment. Through the education of the taste, the ease of the ability to perceive the feeling we feel with regard to the question under judgment, through the education of the imagination, that is the ability to speak the point of view of all the possible others involved in the matter itself with the eyes of the mind, and through the education of the sensus communis. That is an extra sense that allows us to limit our decisions and actions to what protects and promotes the human dignity that should be absolutely common to all. This sensus communis should be one extra sense necessary to feel what is common to all human beings, to feel a sense of unity, a sense of originary bond among people. Why does Hannah Arendt argue in favor of the centrality and the priority of working on the education of these two faculties, thinking and judging? Arendt argues in favor of their centrality and priority precisely because, in her opinion, they can perhaps prevent the repetition of what she calls the scandal that has generated an irreparable fracture in the history of humanity, the crimes against humanity perpetrated by Nazi and fascist totalitarianism. From unwillingness or inability, to choose one's own examples and one's own company, as well as from unwillingness or inability to relate to others who judgment, wrote Arendt, come the true scandal, the true thumbing blocks that men cannot remove because they are not created by human or humanly understandable reasons. They hide the horror and, at the same time, the banality of evil. The banality of an evil that is perpetrated by ordinary people, by the majority of people, 
and it is implemented by what she called the sleep of thought. This banal evil was a drama for the ancient time, in the same way that it is for our time in these days. If the critical thinking and judging capacity clarified in their meaningless sense are the for central and represent a priority, which educational practices can be for us a source of inspiration to work today on quality education in primary school? Pedagogical studies recall in this sense some important figures for their commitment study and intervention in education and scholastic field, precisely with regard to the promotion of the critical thinking and judgment. We think among others of Don Lorenzo Milani, Paolo Freire, Aldo Tappini, a figure less explored, but is at least significant, in particular in the field of primary education, is represented by Danilo Dolci. Yeah. So, we can say that uh, Danilo Dolci shared a certain vision of education with Hannah Arendt, both of whom were awarded the Sonning Prize from the University of Copenhagen for accomplishing meritorious work for the advancement of European civilization. So Dolci received the award in 1971 and Arendt in 1975. Our, our aim is to propose a methodology that integrates both perspectives for a project targeted at primary teaching that focuses on critical thinking and judgment for the promotion of active and responsible citizenship. So Dolce's aspiration was to progress towards a future in which humanity is intimately connected with nature. His vision of the human world and nature as a unified whole which recalls what Hannah Arendt uh, defined as the need for direct and embodied relationships to the natural and human environments as a precondition for human plurality is the essence of Dolce's method, which he himself defined as uh, ecological maiutics and, as its, and uh, has as its key components, communication, creativity and love, and finally empowerment. So um, Dolci, Dolci's ecological maiutics represent the highest fulfillment of what is also known as the reciprocal maiutic approach, a dialectic method of inquiry which aims to stimulate the growth of consciousness by guiding the participant to listen to different points of view and focus on any contradictions that emerge. So the core principle of Dolci's pedagogy is that the first phase is uh, divergence of opinion, and the second phase is the coming together of ideas without compromising uh, uh, points of difference. Dolci practiced his maiutic, uh, maiutic's approach from the very beginning of his experience in Sicily. It was originally mainly directed towards community education and later extended to include, as we will see, children's education. As uh, Hannah Arendt in philosophy and politics, Dolce too is inspired by Socrates' dialectics, which compares the philosopher to a, a midwife of knowledge and avoids the temptation to fill people's minds with information, helping them instead to use dialogue as an instrument to reach the truth. Socrates as midwife, writes Arendt, whose dissolution of the prejudices and prejudgments of his interlocutors helps them towards the revelation of their own thoughts. For Dolce, the educator must try to help the participants to draw out of themselves qualities and abilities that already exist inside them, but which external forces have constrained them to hold in and not express. Educators are not leaders, but experts in the theory and practice of group work involved in, the clari in clarifying the essence of everybody's intuition and experiences. There is, however, an important addition that Dolce makes to Socrates' approach, defining it therefore reciprocal. For Dolce, educators are all those who are not only able to help others to teach themselves, but also those who, who will learn from others and are at the same time students too. 
So a genuine interest in others, a desire to learn how to be with others, as someone who teaches and learns at the same time, is essential. So the approach uh, which he developed and theorized accordingly in its uh, application to children's uh, education, in Chissà se pesci piangono, I wonder if fish cry, published in 1973, became the cornerstone for the teaching of the Mirto Educational Center, which he opened in January 1975. Dolce not only consulted educators and psychologists, but brought together the children themselves and their parents for reciprocal maiutic sessions so that the school might meet the needs and desire of those directly concerned. For Dolce, education is learning to see and observe through one's eyes, one's ears, one's skin, through one's whole being through roots and umbilical cords that reach out in the world. In Dolce, there's also the need to contribute to the development of a sense of responsibility and of our status as citizens of the world. For Dolce, the maiutic approach should not be limited only to interpersonal relationships. Nature, trees, flowers, animals, insects, lakes, and, seal, and seas all speak and are able to teach those, uh, those able to observe and listen to what they have to say. We need to look at how to deepen and widen our powers of, of, of observation, how to exercise and express it in different ways, how to widen our field of experience, how to enhance and value experience in order to try to resolve the problems that life throws at us. So propiduty to Dolce's reciprocal maiutic approach is communication. There's no maiutics without communication, writes Dolce, who defines communication as the capacity to develop through dialogue. For Dolce, Communication means, above all, to have in common, to share, to bear together. The verb to communicate, in Latin comunicare, also means to involve others in a munus, munus signifying gift, task, service, duty, kindness, advice, agreement. It involves a spiritual tension that encompasses the body and all things and is renewed in a continual process of creative reciprocity. At the start of his maiutic sessions, Dolce used to explain what he meant by communication, focusing on the difference between communication and what he defined as its opposite, transmission. Communication allows us to relate to others on an equal footing and through dialogue to arrive at a solution or a new point of view, having modified our relationship. Transmission, on the other hand, is unilateral, or rather the message of a speaker to a receiver without the possibility of a response, so the receiver is forced into a passive listening role. According to Dolce, we need to rescue the strength and intrinsic ability that each, us, each of us possesses. Power means have the power to do, to be capable of, and distinguishes it from domination, which is the mistaken, negative, and violent use of power. Domination is that power over another, being that restricts their liberty, their needs, and even their potential. For Dolce, communication is the only way to stimulate creativity and solve problems. He maintains that our worst enemy is the fear of being creative, the lack of courage, the inability to rouse ourselves from our deep inertia, also when it comes to planning and organization. Creativity becomes self-realization, enabling each of, each of us to express our most profound thoughts and feelings. We need to seek out suppressed or hidden creativity and bring it to the light, endowing it with worth and value, including through group activity. To grow creatively, we learn day by day, and this is a lengthy process, both on the personal and on the collective level. Dolce's idea about education are often illustrated through analogies with art. A work of education, like a work of art, 
comes into being as it develops and it evolves in a way that is, by definition, unforeseeable. The unforeseeable, the element of discovery and self-discovery, are keys to Dolce's maiutic approach. Dialogue, communication, and creativity are inseparable. Creativity helps the individual to achieve his or her potential, both from a psychological and emotional perspective and in terms of how we interact and engage with others. The concept of creativity in Dolce is closely linked to love. Love is nothing than the most intimate creative communication. Love is an instrument of knowledge, we can conclude, in that it generates creativity, but is also, as Dolce says of creativity, the ability to hold together something that appears fragmented. And this holding together is giving meaning to things. And this, in the end, is what Dolce was aiming to achieve through his reciprocal meiotic meetings, taking a fundamental step towards formulating a plan of action by becoming aware of one's own possibility and potentialities. This awareness means as well independence from dominant opinions, from subjugation to others, and being able to assert oneself. The big change, Dolce says, comes out slowly and can start with the rejection of, idea, of the idea that every person needs to be owned and controlled by someone else, with the rejection of the opinion that human beings are imperfect creations from which nothing perfect can come, with the rejection of the prejudice that the domination of one human being by another is necessary along with its attendant implications of rule and rule and obedience subjugation. Empowering people, providing them with the means to determine their own destiny, summarize the aim of Dolce's maiutics. Making individuals aware of their own capabilities helps them to find solutions for their own needs, identifying plans and strategies to achieve them. This process, via which people learn to express their personal power as part of the deep felt need to be creative, known as conscientization or critical consciousness, can be linked to Freire's and be defined as learning to perceive social, political, and economic contradictions and to take action against the oppressive elements of reality. As with Freire, Dolce fostered an empowered community invoking a world in which humanity lives in nonviolent harmony with nature, coexisting in a perfect power balance as opposed to existing as a burden and a flourishing at the expense of others. Like Freire, aside from working towards restoring powers to individuals, Dolce also supported the ability to choose and the autonomous planning of the time of development identified, identified by the group. As Dolce said in the presentation of the Mirto Center's program, first thing in the morning, groups were formed around specific activities and each group would choose a different coordinator and a different evaluator every week and try to get at least one parent involved in the whole process. It was Dolce's firm belief that the children should have the chance to participate in the cooperative meetings, just as the parents participated in the center's activities. Dolce's conviction was that people in general are not aware of their own problems, but are subject to them and to educate oneself also means become, becoming able to identify, to make choices. For the ideal city that Tolchi had in mind, the terrestrial city, the new city sense needs to be able to face and solve problems at an individual, group, and structural level. An ideal city in which, as Hannah Arendt brought to light into human condition, neglected human capacity as being plural and capable of new perspectives and new actions are essential. For Dolce, the development of the idea that to educate is to offer to someone the opportunity to make their life creative, in fact, to see their life as a art, an act of uh, creation. According to Dolce, school of his time suffocated children, repressing all creativity. One severe drawback the school has had was their inability to pose magnetic questions, a failure to strengthen the natural questioning instinct from the earliest infancy, the widest range of the context. State school was for Dolce 
a place characterized by domination where children were typically expected to acquire discipline and memory skills. So the aim of Dolce's ecological maiutics was instead to create a healthy environment where children can grow and learn, becoming responsible of their own lives and futures, and ultimately of their own education. From this uh, theoretical frame and on the basis of the Arendtian and the Dolce perspective about the promotion of the critical judgment in primary school, a research project is going on at the University of Turin. It will develop during the scholastic years 2021 and 22 and 2022 and 23 in the primary school David Bertrand of Piossasco near Turin, involving 10 teachers, uh, Nicoletta Sibona is connected to us uh, now, and two classes. The uh, research methodology refers to the participatory action research. It is a research methodology particularly fertile, not only in the social field, but also in the field of the primary school, and in particular because of its commitment to transforming society. Action research, in fact, is intending to propose itself in an experience of empirical and qualitative research aimed not only at the study of phenomena, but especially to their transformation on the basis of the needs genuinely perceived and identified by the teachers involved, which have the role of co-researchers. Within this methodological perspective, the research planning is articulated in two different phases for each scholastic year. Firstly, from February to April 2022, a path of teacher's training and biological design for, um, of an educational activity on the promotion of the judgment capacity. This phase is facilitated by the researcher and observed by two critical friends. Vele is one of uh, these two critical friends. Secondly, uh, from May to June 2022, an educational activity with children uh, um, from six to nine years old within the maths and the language disciplines. The educational activity will be, uh, will be projected by the teachers referring to five steps inspired to the path identified by Hannah Arendt for the promotion of the judgment capacity. The taste, the thinking by oneself, the dialogical confrontation, the imagining, the intersubjective deliberation and the common action. These five steps will be followed starting from an experience, effect, a social problem on which to exercise the judgment capacity. For example, and this is an example created by Nicoletta Sibona, the experience of the different breads the children can eat in the same community starting from different social and cultural belongings. So, how do the different bread taste? Do we like, dislike? Do we know the stories of these breads? What do they mean for the people who usually eat them? How do they bake and prepare this particular bread with a special sauce, with the meat? How we can discuss our point of view or, or experiences? How can my personal taste change when I taste the same bread again after this discussion? after the narration of the people involved in person or through our imagination, because they could live very far from us. And what is the classes agreed decision and action on the topic of eating different kinds of bread? How can this decision and action positively affect or transform the community? Between the next scholastic year, 2022 and 23, these two phases will be repeated in order to improve the teacher training and educational practice experimentation. Thank you very much for your attention. And so we are at your disposal for some questions.
Okay, so while we wait for people to gather their thoughts and prepare a question, I just want to thank you. That was um, really um, such a rich collaboration, you know, bringing together Arendt and um, Dolce. And and there's just, all, I'm always surprised, you know, um, when, when you hear um, of uh, educational philosophers and and the similarities and overlap and connection and how they can be really generative so thank you for presenting presenting that and i and I really it, it's kind of resonating with um some of the work that i'm doing currently thinking about the non-human and so i found your bread example really interesting um and i just wondered if you could tell us a little bit more about how that took shape in your um your research itself you know engaging those six to nine year olds in a in a deliberative and um philosophical discussion about bread i just think is really fascinating uh, thank you very much um for your considerations uh, uh, for uh, our uh, research pro process, uh, we are at the starting point. Uh, indeed, we uh, started uh, with the uh, first part of uh, uh, the research with the formative uh, uh, meetings, um, in which uh, we are creating the research groups uh, with the teachers and uh, the two critical friends. Uh, we have some uh, uh, ideas, for example, uh, thanks to the work of Nicoletta Sibona, the idea of, uh, the, um, of uh, testing the different kinds of bread. That is an idea um, uh, put in the frame of uh, the um, disciplinary uh, field of Nicoletta Sibona, that is the historical and uh, literary field. But um, at the same time we have uh, no, um, we have any plan about uh, the realization of this activity because uh, we uh, want, we want to construct the planning, the, um, the uh, identifying of, of the different activities with the uh, teachers. Uh, we, realize, we will realize five uh, format meetings and uh, in the last two meetings we will find the particular activities. So uh, if the teachers group uh, will agree uh, with this idea of uh, the different kind of breads, we will plan and then the teachers will realize the activity within the lesson from May to the first days of June. And then we will collect um, uh, all the materials that the children uh, will realize during the activity the teachers will record uh, these activities and so in the summer we will uh, we, we will able to uh, analyze in an interpretative way uh, the written materials uh, and the um, some pictures, maybe some pictures that the, the children will realize during the activity. Um, maybe if it will be possible, the teachers uh, will bake the bread <laughs> together with the children or um, Simply, we uh, they will eat different kinds of bread, and then from tasting, uh, they will continue the discussion to uh, reach a, a more uh, a more complex judgment uh, on this topic. Fascinating. Thank you. Just, just throwing out to the floor, does anybody else have a question? Let me just check. Thank you. Uh, Sid, do you want to present this question directly or would you like me to, to read it out? 
I can read it out. Okay, so um, Sid says, uh, like me, um, he was thinking of the resonances and similarities with other pedagogical approaches, particularly those coming from the Italian context like uh, Montessori and Reggio Emilia. Um, and it makes um, them wonder if there were exchanges or if uh, they influenced each other's thinking and practice. So is there, you know, how does that work in the, the Italian context of this kind of cross pollination of, of these great um, pedagogical thinkers? Um, can I continue to, okay. Um... Yes, surely uh, there are some links uh, between uh, our perspective and uh, the perspectives of other um, uh, important figures of the uh, pedagogical panorama. In particular, uh, the link between Maria Montessori and our uh, idea of educational practices is surely in the sense of uh, um, to promote the autonomous thinking and acting of the children um, uh, in, in order to promote their way of thinking uh, in a free way in a totally in a totally or quite a good free way but the frame of the two perspectives are different in the point of the naturalist frame and the medical frame of Maria Montessori, especially for the, the most part of her works, and the philosophical frame hermeneutical frame of Hannah Arendt and so of the conception of the meaning of the judgment uh, that is on the base of our perspective. Uh, this is, in, uh, in my opinion, the uh, bigger difference, difference between uh, the two perspectives. The, um, there are uh, deeper links uh, between the perspective of, the, of Danilo Dolci, Aldo Capitini, and the perspective of uh, an errant phenomenological hermeneutical perspective. This is the frame of the meaning of judgment that, that we, can, uh, uh, we can try to improve in um, in uh, our research project. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you for that. So anyone else? Ah, oh, Victoria. Thank you, both of you. That was really interesting. And I've never put those people together. <laughs> <laughs> um, and suddenly when someone else does, you think, oh, of course. And then you have Paolo Freire as a bridge, exactly as um, Abela was describing. So I find that really fascinating how many consonances of thinking there were but i want to interject a problem about the bread <laughs> um <laughs> because it, i think it's true that Freire is quite critical of the digestive concept of knowledge where to eat is to know and he even says you know this of course is a system we've been running for far too long where the children are given the, the material to eat and then vomit it up for tests and exams. So he's quite critical and I think it's important. I love the sound of this project, but I think it's really important. I wanted to ask, are you linking it to Dolce's view of bread as strongly um, a peasant practice, kneading bread, baking bread, and those experiences of the making um, as a very important part of, of um, forming oneself as a trans, you know, as a transformative um, individual with agency, not just eating. Maybe I'll give that to 
Abele. Yes, so there will be a reflection of that. I mean, uh, um, we must take into account that um, uh, uh, making bread in Italian is still a very long tradition, so different type of breads in different areas. And, and, and so that's still the case, you know, in Turin or, or in this school, which is near Turin. So we are not in a sort of, in, fortunately, you know, in an era in which all of this belongs to the past. So to some extent, the children still, uh, uh, I would say, appreciate, you know, the importance of bread because they can, uh, you know, have the possibility to try different types of bread, but, you know, breads that is produced locally as well. They still see, hopefully, many are, maybe their mothers making breads as well, or their grandmothers, rather. And so there's still this link, and of course that will inevitably uh, lead, um, I'm sure that that will be the case, and uh, Emanuela can confirm, on, of course, uh, uh, reflection, um, uh, on, uh, on the importance of bread, you know, in, in general. So there will be that, of course, that reflective part. So it wouldn't be just in, in itself, uh, you know, let's say, closed on the idea of uh, reflecting on their own experience, or as you said, rightly said, you know, of digesting something that is given to them. So well, they will make their bread. Mm. So they will, uh, um, yeah, as I said, um, as actually, um, Emanuela said, so the teacher will be involved in this as well, in preparing the bread with them. Mm. But of course, they will choose the type of bread. So it's not something that, uh, so will come, of course, from uh, um, their own, uh, let's say, a suggestion and in initiative too. So mm. it's not something induced. And hopefully, yeah, they will uh, uh, digest it because they will uh, uh, learn will uh, reflect, let's say, rather, more on, uh, on, on, the, on the fact itself, uh, you know, of making a bread for our sustaining, but also uh, on the importance of bread. In, mm. Uh, mm. I mean, not just for uh, daily life, but even, uh, let's say, from uh, a sort of uh, um, historical point of view, you know, for an, uh, for the Italian community, which I said is very varied in that sense because uh, there are so many and different uh, still nowadays, and that's mm. the case with Turin, uh, you know, the Turin area as well, uh, even uh, different dialects that are still spoken, but also tradition, that's something. Right, bread, so you have uh, bread with different dialects. Yes, yeah, yeah well, I mean, uh, maybe Emanuela can, uh, I don't know whether yeah. to comment I'm on thinking. that a bit more. I mean, this is my assumption, I'm not <laughs> concluding as Emanuela. But. Because children are so imaginative, you know, that I think that's such a beautiful metaphor, bread, isn't it? Yeah. Because they can imagine what, how the bread speaks, what voice it has, yeah, exactly. um, what dialect it uses. Um, and I'm, I'm sure Jane's thinking yeast, um, bacteria, you know, uh, yeah. so there are all those processes that are involved in the making of the bread that are also is such yes. an excellent metaphor, isn't it, for Indeed, uh, your project. <laughs> Victoria, uh, while you are speaking, um, I uh, connected uh, um, the, um, two elements um, that are very important in our mind for our research project uh, to create an experience for children uh, to connect the taste, the subject to taste, mm -hmm. the possibility to um, subjectively and immediately uh, taste the breads, for example, mm -hmm. and then to exercise, to promote their imaginative capacity. Mm to uh, reflect on the topic under uh, examination, but also to reflect on all the other possible points of view mm -hmm. connected to the topic. So we are testing in this way and in different way, each uh, uh, one uh, from each other. And then the other um, children in other places, how can, uh, taste this uh, bread in the same way, in the different way. So exercise taste 
uh, as the base on which to pose the exercise of imagination and then the exercise of the sensus communis in the, yeah. way, in the Kantian way and in the Rentian way. Mm -hmm. uh, in the sense um, to uh, challenge ourselves to find uh, a possible um, common sense a possible common view on uh, the topic of the different threads. Mm. Mm. How can be our uh, our point of view mm. uh, as class about the topic of uh, the different kinds of breads uh, that characterize our our different cultures in the same class? Mm. in which there will be a lot of different uh, families, uh, different children and so on. So, um, actually the link between taste to imagination to census communis. Mm. Maybe is a research, so <laughs> we <Yes>. can say <laughs> now the results. <laughs> well, no, you can't say because it's like Dolce yes. says, every work yes. of education is like a work of art. Yes, so yes. You are just going to have to follow a process and mm -hmm. and the children will direct, yes. I think, into some really interesting imaginative answers and further questions. So on that note, I think we'll, you'll just have to come back and, um, and, and tell present us. again mm -hmm. what happened. Where did where did the bread take you? Um, mm -hmm. where, where did the what did the children do with it? I I just am fascinated to see mm -hmm. the, see and hear and smell and taste the sequel. So um, just just a, an enormous thank you for um, for sharing your work today, and I think it's got us all thinking really deeply um about you know what what's possible through research and 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 what happens when you bring these philosophers and ideas and concepts and practices together so huge thank you very much indeed um and please do you. consider coming back for a sequel thank you thank you very thanks, much thanks everyone so the recording thank of this you. will be up on the website many thanks okay bye bye right. thank you bye thank you